Okay, let's see what else he said. He said, when the women and girls are taken on board a ship naked, trembling, terrified, they are often exposed to the wanton rudeness of white savages. The prey is divided upon the spot. Look at the choice of words, the prey. Resistance or refusal would be utterly in vain. And then he says, I sinned with a high hand. Yeah, and then he wrote Amazing Grace. <laughs> okay. So it's really important to understand that hand in hand with the behavior was a mindset that is so damaging. You see, I call it the secret. Not the secret that everybody's been talking about, this, that secret. This secret is the kind that makes you sick. How many people here are in mental health, do specific, have done direct mental health treatment with folks? If you're not into, you know that the secrets make us sick, yes? Isn't it the secrets that cause people the pathology? Right? How long have white people had to hold this secret? How long and how many generations had to stop and pretend grandpa didn't do what he did? That the wealth we enjoy was not on the backs of some of these little girls. Think about how long one had to keep that secret. And the only thing you could do is either pathologize the other, it's all their fault, because it certainly wasn't great granddad. Look how well he dresses. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this, when I say that this pathology goes hand in hand, I kid you not. Then you have science. And whenever we are in a process of trying to legitimize things, it's so amazing. You know, people always say this to me, even black people, when they hear about post-traumatic. Because you know it's not correct unless you can count it and measure it, right? Science is the, the final. It is the number one. If you can say it's scientific, then you basically trump everything else, right? Science determines reality. So if we can scientifically assert a thing to be true, then in fact it is true because it's scientifically proven. It's a scientific fact. Matter of fact, that's what people will tell you when you, when you try to say to them, I don't know if I agree with you. You know, it's scientific. It's a scientific fact, what I'm saying here, right? Which somehow makes it what? True. And it's also in a book. Now let's do the math. It's in a book and it's scientifically proven. Did anybody here realize that recently we lost a planet? Can anybody know what planet we lost? How you lose a planet? <laughs> you know, I, was, I became fond of the little picture with the, we lost a planet. We didn't lose a planet. You know what it means? Science was wrong. Now, have they ever said, you know, we were wrong about that planet thing? No. It's called a paradigm shift. So let's go to science, and I think it's important that we do. So we then, again, we go to someone named Carl von Linnaeus. Now, Carl von Linnaeus becomes an important character in this whole conspiracy of silence and legitimacy and removing the dissonance. Carl von Linnaeus developed a system based on a criterion of skin color and laid the basis for 19th century racial classification. Linnaeus properly began the science of anthropology. So here we have the father of anthropology. Although color classification of races dated back to the ancient Egyptians, anthropologists refer to Linnaeus's Systema Natura of 1735 as the first modern study of man. While Linnaeus advanced classification with his use of a color criterion, he also fixed on his four families of man certain moral and intellectual peculiarities that continued into the 19th century anthropological vocabulary. He described Homo Americanus. Who might that be? That would be Native Americans, American Indians. Homo Americanus, and what did he say about them? He said they were reddish, choleric, obstinate, contented, and regulated by custom. Homo Europaeus, as white, fickle, sanguine, blue-eyed, gentle, and governed by laws. Homo Asiaticus, that'd be Asians, as sallow, grave, dignified, avaricious, and ruled by opinions and homo affer, as black, phlegmatic, cunning, lazy, lustful, careless, and governed by caprice. 
These insights into what Linnaeus defined as racial character, personality traits, behavior, intelligence, language, and a host of other related categories were transmitted into subsequent attempts at a science of classification and became more fixed than the races themselves. Not a shred of science here. But it is in a book. And it's touted as science. And what's more important, you know my students, I teach graduate students in, in social work. And I'll say, but Dr. Leary, my God, we're looking at 1707 to 1778. We are, right? After all. But do you not hear these same attributions today? You know those blacks, they're lazy, you know. All of the exact same, am I telling the truth? In your newspapers, in your accounts of them, do you not hear these very same things? So does it matter that it started in 1707 and 1778 and has no scientific merit? That's multi-generational, is it not? It's being passed along. It's part of the swallowing into the social gullet. Those are the beliefs, you see. So it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. And thank you, Carl von Linnaeus. Again, he's removing the cognitive what? Don't they deserve to be treated the way we treat them? Have we not just justified what we've done? After all, I just told you this is who they are. We're not wrong. We're just trying to keep the uh, domestic tranquility. Makes sense. I'm having a clicker thing. There we go. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, just look at him. He's not right, we could tell already. <laughs> but he had to contribute his part as well. He says, now this man, Johann uh, Friedrich Blumenbach, he was an individual, how many of you are familiar with the term Caucasian? Oh yes, <laughs> then you know Johann. He designated five races or varieties of man in the, session, in the second edition of his work on the natural variety of mankind. His division into Caucasian, Mongolian, American, Ethiopian, and Malayan races with the added Carl von Linnaeus descriptive peculiarities became the subsequent basis of most 19th century anthropomedical studies. While Carl von Linnaeus founded his system principally upon skin color, Blumenbach considered a combination of color, hair, skull, and facial characteristics as fundamental means for classifying the five varieties of man. Central to his study was the Caucasian, a term which he originated. He took the name Caucasian, listen for the science, from Mount Caucasus because its southern slope had cradled what he felt to be the most beautiful race of men, the Georgian. The Caucasus near Mount Ararat, upon which the biblical ark came to rest after the flood, seemed the appropriate source for the original race of man. No science yet. Now I'm going to quote him. These are his words. For in the first place, the stock displays, as we have seen, the most beautiful form of the skull, from which is a mean and primeval type, the others diverge by most easy gradations on both sides of the two ultimate extremes. That is, on the one side, the Mongolian, on the other, the Ethiopian. Besides, it is white in color. Anybody here ever met a skull that wasn't? Besides, it is white in color, which we may fairly assume to have been the primitive color of mankind. zippity doo da, no science, nothing to found this whole thing. He figured white skull, humanity began white. It's scary, but it's in a book. is science, and we swallowed it without question. But race is a concept of society that insists there is genetic significance behind human variations in skin color that transcends outward appearance. However, race has no, thank you, 
has no scientific merit outside of sociological classifications. There are no significant genetic variations within the human species to justify the division of races. Mankind is one. We are one humanity. Isn't it a shame that we are still debating that in 2008? But the reason why we continue to debate it is we still try to reconcile the ugly stuff that we've never dealt with. We still want to say they deserved it, so no one has to feel bad about all of those little babies dying and ignoring the ravages of Africa and killing young black males and urban cities all the in disproportionate imprisonment and disproportionate disparities in health. Oh, it must be their fault. How do you reconcile it? You see, rather than deal with it, we, we just continue to try to, to justify the behavior. Thomas Jefferson, you all know him? Yes, he's one of my favorite people, actually. I close out my book with a soliloquy from Thomas Jefferson. I actually end my book with it. Because Thomas Jefferson made a statement. Here's a man highly regarded in the United States. I mean, there are more statues of him than probably anybody. And he made a statement towards the end of his life. He says, indeed, I tremble for my country when I consider that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. You see, it haunted him to his grave because Thomas Jefferson knew. He knew what would happen. Matter of fact, he predicted exactly what we're dealing with today, what happened between people of African descent and those of European descent. Predicted it. He was a bright man. How do you reconcile behaving in such a barbaric way? Well, let's see what he said. He said uh, blacks smelled bad and were physically unattractive. Well, this was inconsistent with his behavior because, you know, he fathered slaves, Sally Hemings. So it didn't smell that bad, huh? <laughs> now, here's a more important one. He said we required less sleep. Now, that one's more interesting to me. Why would he need to? What dissonance was he feeling that he would need to believe that blacks required less sleep? Why? What did he do? You know, he owned slaves. So what do you think? How hard do you think he worked them? What was the work day for a slave? Sunrise to sunset. But do you have any empirical evidence, George? Can you prove that? Because you know, can't, if, if you can't write, you know, count it and measure it, it didn't happen in European culture. Is that correct? You've got to count it and measure it. How many of you have measurable objectives? Measurable outcomes, you better measure it. I don't care if you tell them. Can you tell your boss, really, truly, at the end of the year, we're doing better now? I've been to work every single day I've watched, and I can guarantee you we're doing better. Is that going to fly? <laughs> that would be no. That means you have to count it and measure it. And if you didn't count and measure, it didn't happen. So when you start looking at the notion of requiring less sleep, that's an interesting thing, because I have to believe if I work you that hard, and boy, I, I got humbled when I found out how hard folks worked in the sugar plantations. Ooh-wee, I got humbled by how hard folks in the Caribbean were worked. But what I decided to do is I looked at the Library of Congress. Most of my work over the nine years that it took to write the book, six years of that was research. The other part of it had to do with doing um, interviews of elders and reading slave narratives. And there are thousands of them. This is just one taken from the Library of Congress. Sarah Gudger from North Carolina wrote, never know nothing but work, never knew rest, felt like my back was going to break. This is the gospel truth. Then I looked at uh, what happened in the sugar plantations. And this was amazing. One final set of grim numbers underlines the way slaves on sugar plantations like Codrington, uh, with the plantation of Barbados, were systematically worked to an early death. When slavery ended in the United States, slaves imported over the centuries had grown to a population of nearly 4 million. When it ended in the British West Indies, total slave imports of well over 2 million left a surviving slave population of only about 670,000. More than twice as many slaves were shipped to the island of Jamaica alone than all 13 
uh, North American colonies combined, the Caribbean was a slaughterhouse. In fact, the reason why there was more importation of slaves to these plantations is because they died so frequently. They were treated so badly, ate so poorly, that females never reached their menstrual cycle. They never actually started their menstrual cycles, so they couldn't reproduce, you see. And so many of them died, they had to import more. That's how treacherous it was, you lazy black folks that you are. Isn't that ironic, though? What's so ironic is black people run from the shame of feeling like they're perceived as lazy. I, I mean, I live with that so much that when I would go to hotels, I would leave it cleaner. Because your mother, everybody's mother taught you, leave it cleaner than you found it. So black folks are so hypersensitive, I was cleaning up the hotel room. Because I wouldn't want anyone to think I'm dirty. Right? Now, all the people in the audience that are of color, how much harder did your parents tell you you had to work to get to even? How much harder? You had to work twice as hard. Now, how come I knew that about you? How come I knew that? Think about it. And yet, at the same time, white people think we're lazy, you see? But we're so hypersensitive because of the shame, right? And then our ancestors will work to death, to death. Recently, they unearthed the slave cemetery. They unearthed actually a slave in, uh, cemetery in um, New York City. It's on Wall Street, by the way, in the shadow of the bull. Unearthed the slave cemetery, and they still to this day they're struggling. They recently, you know, have done a lot in terms of commemoration. I went to the it took me everything to get to it. They had it blocked off so you couldn't get to it, but they because they didn't want to deal with it. You know, you can't just bulldoze a cemetery. So here in all these skyscrapers in the middle of it is this little cemetery. And there are slaves in that cemetery. More important than that was what the bones told us. Because, you know, now, you know, you got CSI. <laughs> Hell, I can go in there and tell you what's going on now. <laughs> you know, so with the CSI thing, now, I, you know, they, they've discovered a little bit about the bones. And to me, the most phenomenal thing about the bones is what they told us about those people and how they live. Majority of the people in there were children. Infants and children, high mortality, infant mortality rate. They even know what they died of. Died of uh, malnutrition and starvation, because they could tell by the rotting of the teeth in the jawline. So even though they most likely grew food, they weren't allowed to eat it. And then they found something even more peculiar that speaks to this idea of why he believed we required less sleep. They would show a large frame man and they would find an injury where the muscle actually detached itself from the bone as a result of exertion and not injury. Stay with me. It, it detaches itself from the bone as a result of exertion. That means you work so hard, the muscle detached itself from the bone. You don't see those kind of injuries in contemporary society because no one's going to work that hard. Unless, of course, you have a gun trained on you from sunrise to sunset. So we do have empirical evidence of how hard folks work. Then he went on to say that we were dumb, cowardly, and incapable of feeling grief. Why would Thomas Jefferson need to believe that? Why would he need to believe we didn't feel grief? What was he doing, do you think, that produced cognitive dissonance? You were killing people, not only were you killing people, beating them, you were selling them, yes? Selling mothers away from their children and husbands away from wives. And surely they don't feel it, because if they felt it, that would make them human like me. So I simply say, and you see, it's not so much, not, it's not even so much that he said it, but he was an important person. If Joe, nobody said it, but he said it. So what do you think the rest of the folks, uneducated uh, laborers, believed? Well, they don't feel grief, you know. After all, Thomas Jefferson says they don't. So he becomes a critical person in making those statements. But you see, it was all to relieve and to set settle the conscience that he died with. But these become very important as you see how these things move forward. Then there was J. Marion Sims. I won't spend a lot of time with him. He's another figure. You can Google him. He's a, there's a statue, actually, of him in Central Park. 
And J. Marion Sims was an individual credited, he was a father of uh, modern gynecology. How many women in here know what a vaginal speculum is? And for those men in the room that we lost, <laughs> a vaginal speculum is a device designed to open up the vagina. It was considered uh, one of the most important advancements in medicine uh, that was made. He was credited as being the wealthiest man uh, to have, wealthiest physician to have ever lived. And what's interesting about him, you know, look at the medals pinned on him. I was just very curious about how it was uh, they regarded this man because no one ever really looked at how did he come up with that vaginal speculum. The way he did it was he, he actually uh, worked on unanesthetized, created, ex did experiments on unanesthetized slave women. He created a, a makeshift hospital in his backyard in the mid-1800s. He built the first vaginal speculum from a pewter spoon. And he reasoned that slave women were able to bear great pain meaning we don't need any anesthesia, because their race made them more durable and thus they were well suited for painful medical experimentation. We didn't even, you know, because we didn't feel like other women could feel. This man would cut into women, cut into them, and just said, well, since they're black, they don't really feel it. Unbelievable. And more importantly is what he did to infants, because not only did he experiment on women, he also experimented on infants. He said that black infants suffered from something he called trimus nascentium, which is now commonly referred to as neonatal tetanus. Neonatal tetanus originates in horse manure, which was a likely cause of the disease in slave infants. He, contrib he attributed it to the indecency and intellectual flaws of slave infants together with skull malformations at birth. Um, that is a shoemaker's awl, and that's an 1800s shoemaker's awl. He would stick that into the heads of brand new infants in an effort to realign their skulls based on the indecency and intellectual flaws of their parents. 